Hello and welcome back to the Voice of Old Town YouTube channel. Today's guest of the House of the Stag podcast is Max Rotsley, aka Saloran Marbrand. Hey, how are you doing? Very well, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. So let's jump right in, shall sure. we? No, ask me anything. As long as it's not a spoiler, I can answer it. <laughs> we, we shall see. Um, you guys recently went all out for the House of the Dragon Season 2 rep party. Sure. How good does it feel to be able to party after months of enduring tough shoots? Um, it was a very fun party. I'm not going to argue with that. And we didn't uh, have quite the same thing on season one because it was coming off the back of COVID. So I think they were kind of saving us a really big bash. So there was mm. enormous dragon ice sculptures and orchestras and stuff. And it was, yeah, it was really fun. It was nice to see everybody with their hair down and a sense of, of proper achievement. You know, it's been a long year. Um, I'm not, I mean, I, we're not down minds it's been an amazing experience as well but you know it's nice to kind of feel that level of completion and know that we're you know we're past the shooting stage and i think all of us are now excited to see what happens next oh we are as well we are for sure excited as well so i was going to ask you what is your favorite memory from set do you have any funny stories um well i spent a lot of time around the painted table hmm. um, and the painted table can be quite a uh it's quite a repetitive shoot because of the nature of the way you cover the scene. Um, we spend a lot of hours in there. Um, having good company makes the day go really well. So having people like Nicholas Jones and Phil Daniels and Emma and, you know, and other new cast members, I won't mention names of, um, mm. it's a happy gang. And luckily because of the camaraderie of those, those sequences, um, we keep each other laughing quite a lot. So a lot of silly times around that table and a lot of, um, Usually about the names, you know, we have a lot of fun about, you know, is it Aegon and Aegon or Rhaenyra or Rhaenyra or all those kind of things. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun to be to be on set with those guys. And it's an amazing room, like, the, yeah, the, the, it looks incredible. And the table as well, they really improved I mean, that. You know, no acting required, it's built, you mm. know. It's, and this year, I think people are going to be excited to see more of Dragonstone. Mm. Uh, the set is bigger, better, there's more of it. So people get more of a sense of, of what, you know, life at Dragonstone is like. Oh, can't wait. Can't. Yeah. Can't wait to cool. see it. Um, your character is one of the few who stayed truly loyal to Rhaenyra. No way you also stayed loyal to Viserys, who obviously wanted Rhaenyra to succeed him. Would you say that your character resembles honor? I think at the best, the White Cloaks should represent that. Absolutely. Um, and I think for... Sir Laurent, that is paramount. You know, that is the decision that he's made. That's the life he's chosen um, and feels very honoured to have been selected for that for that task. So I think it's very large part of his um, DNA, which is a sense of duty and um, and honour and loyalty to his oath. I mean, I think if you if you read the, the, the actual oath that the White Cloaks have to make, it's a pretty serious deal. You know, you 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 decide you're not going to have children, you won't take title, you won't have your land. Um, but what you gain from it is this sort of sense of duty and the sense of loyalty to the crown that is a unparalleled position of trust, I suppose. Um, what was your favourite scene to film in season one and why? Um, do you know what? It was quite fun being up the hill in Monsanto for the, for the, um, for the coronation. Mm -hmm. It was pretty cold and uh, and it was a it was it's a it's a very big climb i mean getting up to that mountain was was interesting but there is i remember saying to to ryan one day i was like today's a very game of thrones day you know it's like 150 extras there's a drone camera flying past there's a fire um there's a crown being handed up i mean elliot turning up at the end of that sequence is just such a cool moment and i think he smashed it you know it's such a I, I think from season one that like that feels like the, like the iconic moment where we kind of yes we realize that there's there's two there's two crowns there's two kings there's two there's a queen and the king there's that there's such a like pivotal moment i remember standing in monsanto with the sun coming up and this unbelievable landscape spreading out and all the beautiful extras in their extraordinary costumes uh and i had that total kind of moment I was like wow i'm in this this is mm. This cool thing to be at work for, you know? Yeah, I love that scene. It's it, also the music that accompanies the scene is incredible. Like they yeah, really and as well. I think Greg did such an incredible job on 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 that on directing that episode. I think it really kind of 
the tension just built so perfectly and it kind of hit all the things you needed to have narrative wise at the same time sort of not losing the, the heart of the characters definitely definitely so i'd love to give this one over to the fans at on uh, okay. at this exact uh, point because we had a lot of fan questions i'd love to uh, ask you as many as as we can sure we shall see. shoot what can i help with huh. so the very first one is from McCavity. how much do you know about the backstory of your characters did the writers slash directors tell you about house marbrand or did you make it up for yourself um i think it's a combination of obviously having read the book you know so, so going back and getting a sense of the, what's what's on the page um and uh i mean i was a bit of a game of thrones fan anyway so i've read i read all of the original kind of novels um so there's get a, a couple of mentions of ashmark what's i suppose interesting is the difference between having a, a you know, something on a page and then obviously having to perform it and, and 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 putting it into three dimensions and into into a character is that you do get a little bit of space to create on your own and i think a combination of those things answering asking questions to sarah or to ryan they always have an answer they're incredibly well prepared and and researched so if you have a question there's usually an answer for it but they're also very open to kind of you discovering you know your own character within this this world um and I think the Ashmark thing is interesting because within the within the war, within the kind of history, um, obviously Ashmark's right near Lannisport and right near that kind of part of the world. So historically, you would have sort of put them and uh, the Marbrands with the Greens, um, which puts me in a very interesting position because obviously, like anything, when you're in war, you're thinking about your family at home. You're also thinking about what you're doing on your day to day. And that's where I think the... Um, the loyalty to the white cloak really sort of comes out like actually at the end of the day that's the kind of premium um moral pillar of mar brown which is that he's made this pledge this is the vow he's made to his queen um and yeah that that's integral to who he is it's a very it's, interesting inner conflict could we expect yeah, something like this in the future i don't know whether they'll ex it but it's certainly something that i always like to have in the back of my mind mm. for performance i think anything anything you can do to inform um i suppose yourself and your own sort of emotional state within the the, the imagined story is is powerful and useful um and i think yeah it informs the conflicts that are happening externally as well as internally the next one is from magor with teats <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, were there any interesting behind the scenes moments for season two? Oh, there were lots, but whether I can share any of them with you, I don't know. No. Um, we laughed a lot. I mean, when you have obviously quite a lot of CG work to, to, to factor in, um, there's a lot of eyeline decisions and, and things. So there are certain scenes where uh, I'm with Emma and, um, and another lead character and, and there was a, there was a couple of days where we were doing a lot of eyeline fighting. You know, there's this here and there's that there. And there's a dragon there and there's a dragon moving over there. Um, and uh, one of our directors was insanely good at performing dragon for us. Uh, but that that was a really fun day at the office because, um, yeah, yeah they really action. they really lent in. And we had dragon breath and dragon roars and all this stuff. So you're reacting to this imagined enormous terrifying beast but actually your director is sort of just on the soundstage there <laughs> oh. filling it up for you um so that was fun and funny oh yeah um it's a it's an interesting thing in general right because even though the sets they're all incredible you can't you, it, there there's no dragons uh there, there are no dragons. No, it's like broomsticks you will have on set is sometimes you'll have like there'll be a sort of a the, the, the head puppet of the dragon mm. which they will um use usually to light or to kind of at the end to make sure they kind of got the they've got a like a pre -vis for the um the cg so that they, they have those on set but they're not to scale so that'll be you know a small head like that uh, most of it is kind of you know tennis ball acting um but for the big uh sort of set piece scenes i suppose um what they quite often will do is do a, a pre -vis, which looks like a kind of slightly badly animated computer game so you'll have all the camera moves are already kind of pre-prepared by the director um there'll be a pre so there'll be a dragon we had this very cool moment where um we were trying to sort of wrap our heads around exactly that like where we're looking and one of the crew was just like oh it's on the it's on the ipad 
and it actually because <laughs> you could use it like um i don't know uh, what's the word like uh, on your phone when you have like you put an animal on your desk or whatever else like um, virtual reality sort of virtual space yeah. thing you could hold up the ipad and then see where the dragon would be within the reality of the scene. So oh, it'd be wow. like the background would be in our, our set, but then you could bring up Vega or Moondog, whoever it was you were looking at. And then you could pan using the iPad and see in situ what was going to happen, which was very cool tech and nothing I'd seen before. Like we didn't have that on season one. I certainly didn't. Well, if we did have it, I didn't see it. Mm. Um, mm. But it was very cool to kind of get a sense of how the crew are already wet one step ahead they all kind of know exactly where it's going to be and what what it's doing and that information obviously helps you on set so you are as informed as you can be the next one is from the dragon demands we kind of went into it already but um okay how do you approach your characters in a conflict how smarbrand follows their lannister overlords and therefore sides with aegon but your character is sworn to rhaenyra i just i think to reiterate i think he is honored he was honored with this um yeah it's, it's a very specific place in within the um sort of the hierarchy of westeros they are servants you know really they're guards more than anything else they're not equals with the uh, with their um the people they're looking after but there is a level of respect given to the white cloaks that is above and beyond lots of the other kind of lords and ladies of westeros you know it's it's something that if you are selected to do and, and offered, it's an extraordinary honor. Um, I think that's how Sir Lawrence sees it. You know, that, that he's been, he's won the right to have this position within the court. Um, and it's something he's genuinely proud of. And, and I think, I mean, the way I've always felt from my perspective, the character is, um, it's sort of like you take on a new family. It's like that thing of like, this is the new reality. These are the people that you were loyal to above everybody else. And once you've made that vow, um, your fellow white cloaks, the the crown that you're protecting, they are number one. And then number two can be whatever else it is. But once that does vow has been made, and I think if that is the the nature of the character, the the the, the man, that I think then the, he leans into that very strongly. Um, and that's always the way I felt about Marbrand. I think he is single mindedly. I'm not convinced single-mindedly um focused on protecting Rhaenyra you know and that is he wakes up in the morning and that's his job that'll be his job before he goes to sleep at night and he will worry about it all day long that's you know wherever those threats come you'll see I think within season two you'll see there are moments where you might blink and miss it but there's always a hand to the hilt for me like anything that I'm always trying to keep as vigilant as possible around mm -hmm. her um even if you know I'm not the focus of the scene or anything else is that that like thinking always, 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 that, you know, where are the exits? Being the guard, being the man in between her and trouble at all times. But that's how it should be. I mean, that is, uh, yeah. that's perfect. I like how, how much you're, you're into um, history and... and, and... Well, I was a big Thrones fan. Mm -hmm. I was a big Thrones fan. I mean, I loved that show. I'd read one of the books, I think, before the first TV show went out and, and liked it and really kind of um, fallen in love with the world that R.R. Martin creates. I think it's so incredibly visceral and, and and believable i think the genius behind the writing is that and actually particularly in in, in what we're doing with house of dragons is because it's written as a history is it has a sense of, of real kind of rooted in reality you have a sense of this being a, a a true historical epic you could totally read it alongside i know norman conquest stuff or stephen and matilda which i think is kind of loosely where the dance of the dragon is based um and the only bit you really have to kind of stretch the imagination for his dragons and, and i find that a very easy reach for me that was a very kind of uh, comfortable space to uh, to lean into uh and yeah i love i love the world i loved the show i thought it was fantastic so being able to kind of play in the sandbox is like you know it's, it's it's a lovely opportunity to go as a fan to go and, go and do the stuff that you already um are attracted to yeah perfect um the next one is from the LSD bear. Who do your who do your fellow Queen's Guards respect more, Damon or Rhaenyra? Within the Queen's Guards, I think Rhaenyra. Mm. I think the Gold Cloaks are uh, a Damon's gang, um, but he's not king. You know, he may be a region to be important, obviously to be absolutely respected and obeyed. Mm. But if you know, if somebody comes into the room, I'm not protecting him. I'm protecting her. 
you know, and I think that the same would be said of uh, of of um, uh, Sir Eric and and um, and Sir Stefan Darklin. I think all of us, you know, that's that's why we're there. The next one is from Unwin Peak. How much do you agree with the following statement? Bastards are treacherous by nature. It's in their blood. Betrayal comes as easily to a bastard as loyalty to true men. I, I, well, I don't, I'd say strongly disagree. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't think that, uh, I think, uh, interestingly, this goes back to us discussing whether um, it's like nature and nurture. That I can be loyal to Rhaenyra and be a Marbrand. Mm. Um, loyalty is a decision you choose. You know, it's not something that's that's bred into you. It's not, you know, you're not good or evil by by dint of blood or background. The decisions you make are the ones that um, inform. It's a quote from Fire and Blood. I think he was still gonna be <laughs> trying to be sneaky. Um, the next one is from Oscar. How comfortable is the Queen's Guard armor? Not very. <laughs> I imagine. Uh, I imagine so. Funny enough, the armor. I mean, you sort of get strapped in early in the day and it's it can uh, the, the armor is, is, is in itself quite um rigid but actually the problem comes with the weight of the cloak which is ironic i suppose um because the cloak hangs on the shoulder and it kind of pulls you into a slight stress position where you're kind of because there's so much weight on it that you kind of have to stand incredibly tall with the weight on your shoulders um it was better this season we had a little bit they did a, a few kind of um alterations within the costume mm. since last year um just little tweaks and i suppose they kind of took on board we had different gorgettes and stuff which because last year they just never stay down mm. like the poor costume girls would just be coming up the black top all the time just kind of just pushing you in the chest and trying to keep it down um so that was all redesigned for this year made out of different materials so that kind of stopped moving around and stuff um definitely not great in the back i think all of the all the queen's guard at some point had a little bit of a back issue after months of wearing it but um yeah, it does look pretty cool. It so looks you... amazing. I think it's much improved from what we saw in Game of Thrones. It's it's just, it's it's amazing. I, I also like the helmet and all. It's it looks really cool. Yeah, it kind of shares some samurai um, aesthetics. I think yeah. it's got that kind of yeah sort of Ronin kind of look about it. The next one is by Beautiful Shots. Did you watch Game of Thrones or read the books before? If so, who's your favorite character? I uh, read all the books, watched all the shows. Tyrion. Tyrion. Why is that? Ah, uh, performance is just immaculate. Mm. I mean, it's just talk about somebody who's taken something from the page and made it live in such an amazing way. Uh, and the arc, the, camp, the character arc, is extraordinary. I just, I just loved it. I thought Dinklage just absolutely smashed it. He inhabited it so humanly and brilliantly, and it was funny, and there was pathos, and I just cared. And I kind of wanted him to end up on the Iron Throne. I mean, I was kind of t Team Tyrion for a long, long time because uh, I think he would have been a just king. I absolutely adore his performance as, as uh, Tyrion. Immaculate. It's incredible. Especially in season four when uh, his trial happened, that, that performance in that episode was incredible. Made me read the books, uh, appreciate yeah. the character, visualized even more. Yeah, he's, he's an amazing actor. There's no, two, there's no two ways about that. Yeah. But again, combination yeah. of great actor, really, I mean, brilliantly written scripts, brilliantly realized world that he got to inhabit. I mean, that was a top show. There's a reason that lots of people loved it and watched it because it's brilliant. The next one is from Rin Ray. Who's your favorite Kingsguard member throughout the Song of Ice and Fire history? Well, I'm going to have to say Sir Eric because he's my buddy. <laughs> I'm going to have to say Elliot because... Um, We've spent a lot of time together and he's one of the loveliest human beings you'll ever come across in your life. Um, and I think he's a fascinating character in the books as well. Um, that dynamic between the twins is really, really interesting. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be soppy just cause I love Elle. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say, um, Sir Eric. Oh, all right. Um, the next one is from Matthew Stewart. How heavy is your armor? I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, the armor itself, not too heavy. The cloak, very heavy. Yeah, cloak is is the problem not the not the armor um tark towers asks what are your thoughts about this season compared to the last one how does a regular day of shooting look like on a project like this 
Um, so, so the first question is, what, what do I think is the difference between season one and season two? Yeah, just your general thoughts uh, about this season compared to the last one. Okay, well, I mean, for me, obviously, I only came in I was a tiny, tiny bit in episode eight and, and got really properly established in episode 10 of the last season. So um, I, although I was there a lot, I wasn't there obviously as much as the rest of the cast. I mean, luckily this time around, I've been sort of throughout the season. Um, so for me, it was, to, I felt, um, I suppose I felt more embedded within the show. You know, it was, uh, um, and I got to, follow far more the narratives i mean when i when i came on board for season one i hadn't actually seen the scripts up until season eight uh, episode eight so i was playing catch up a lot i'd be asking matt like, you know what you know i'd read the book but i didn't know exactly where we were sort of the narrative and stuff because it was moving around because of the time leap um i wasn't entirely sure always where you know where we were at and i'd ask questions of the show when i was with greg and be like okay just sort of fill me in but the lovely thing about this time is we actually sat down into table reads for all eight episodes so we got to sit down and, and hear everybody see these new amazing hires that they've got some incredible new actors um who have stepped into this show and and then it's almost like a radio play you know we did about sort of four, four or five mornings in a row went up to Leavesden and sat around the table and, and had them read and then you get a real sense of the kind of overarching narrative of this thing and how big it is like it's a big show like people have got a lot to look forward to oh, yeah. And I mean, as I said, I'm a Game of Thrones fan. So for me, like, I'd be at the best radio player in the world and being like, this is ace to listen to, you know? And I think people are going to be really excited for what they see. Oh, definitely. Can't wait. It's been way too long. Um, so how does a regular day of shooting look like on a project like this? Um, so it's usually a pretty early start. So usually getting, you know, getting a car at sort of six a.m. or something like that. That will take us to studio, and then you know, usual thing: have a bit of breakfast, have a cup of coffee, then costume makeup through the process of that, and then then head to set. Um, at Leavesden, we had quite, quite a lot of big sets. So my stuff was, you know, predominantly at Dragonstone. Um, so we, you know, go over there, sit around. We'd probably. Ha go in and sort of have a little chat with the director in the morning you know what we're going to do they drop in to see us or this is the kind of plan for the day um and then it'd be a combination of either you know stand-ins and rehearsals so we'd rehearse then stand-ins would stand in while the cameras would uh would set up and cameras get and, and you know light the scene and then we come back in um and then you know run the scene however many times and start the coverage and then it's literally like you know, the thing that people don't really get about filmmaking quite often is like, oh, you come and you do it once and then you go. It's like, no, you do it a hundred times in a hundred different ways. And on a show this size, um, those setups can be laborious. You know, we've got some extraordinary, I did a scene towards the end uh, of the shoot, which just had this unbelievably balletic kind of uh, crane move which started at the top of the stairs came down and panned around and picked up another character and pushed through and, and opened up and then you know and then it kind of then it hits the dolly and then it moves again and then it, it pans around and the just the work of that and you've got 10 people pushing the dolly you've got mm -hmm. you know the focus pull you've got the camera up it, it's such a, colle uh, a collegiate atmosphere and such a team effort to get that what will people will see it and they probably won't realize just how work, much work went into that 10 seconds from the planning forward, you know, from Lonnie sitting down, you know, working out the shot to it being kind of talked through with the crew to us actually getting there and doing it. Um, so there's lots of that, you know, on a show this size where the scale is so big and the ambition is so big for the, for how it's going to look, you know, I think it's a very, it's a very ambitious show in, in how they want you to, to, to what they want to paint at the end, what they want you guys to see. Um, the ambition is always huge, which means it's it's a lot of that. You know, it's a lot of kind of waiting for that moment where you're the important bit in the room. A lot of the time, it's somebody else is important in the room, and uh, and cast kind of we're ready always to have that kind of moment, but also be you know constantly prepared to adjust or change or hit a different mark or, or do whatever it is you need to do to kind of help camera, help your director, help the the team you know get the shot that needs to get taken. That's what Julian Lewis Jones. I interviewed him last year, and that's what he said as well. He compared it to theater in a way that he he never he said he was never on a on a production like this where it felt so much like theater, like camaraderie, like you just said. It's oh, it is. I mean, 
it's just the nicest set to be on. I can't, you know, there are no, I couldn't tell you no horror stories. I had a really joyous time. Uh, I felt the same on season one. Greg uh, has brought me on for season one and was just so generous and so, um, just so prepared. I think what's, what's great is like you trust your leaders when they know what they're doing. And when you've got somebody like Ryan, who's show running, and you've got, you know, Greg and Claire and all these amazing directors that we've got and, and Sarah uh, and David, like this whole gang of people at the top of the tree who have done the work, you know, they, they've done the preparation. They know exactly what I mean. Ryan will have an answer for anything you bring to him. You know, he'll always go, he'll, give you, he'll, he'll consider it for a second and he'll give you an answer. And I think when you have that at the top of, of your kind of hierarchy and then you have HBO have made the effort to hire the absolute best camera team, the absolute best camera operators, you know, the, the level of talent and ability that they've brought together to, to make this show. Um, it's a wonderful situation to find yourself in, you know, and I think, you know, excellence breeds excellence. The more people care about it and want to help each other out, the better the show becomes. And I definitely got a sense both seasons that it's just a very happy workplace. You know, people were really, we all want it to be great. You know, and I think a lot of us are fans anyway, you know, fans of great TV, regardless of whether it's Game of Thrones or anything else, but wanting to give the best every day to get the, the best result for, for the fans and for the people who are going to see the show at the end. And you absolutely nailed it, I think. Um, can't wait yeah. again. Um, the summer is going to be exciting. It's going to be big. You guys are going to like it. Um, the next one is from It's Cass Lester. How hard was it to keep your involvement in House of the Dragon a secret? Um, I suppose season one, it was quite tricky because obviously it was such a big show. And I think my mates knew that I was off doing something and I couldn't really tell them what it was about. Um, but there is also that wonderful Christmas morning feeling of knowing that, you know, you've got this great secret that it's going to, you know, that it's going to come out to the world at some point. And we've just had a few cast annou announcements for season two. Uh, and I know I was talking to like Jamie beforehand. Jamie's with, you know, in quite a few scenes with me and he was so having to keep it so under his hat at the same time as like being absolutely kid in a candy store excited about being able to do this extraordinary job. Um, so it's a weird one. You kind of have to share it with the people on set. Mm. You know, the energy's there. It's like the ones that are kind of like, you know, I think um, when the world sees, sees Kieran Booth for the first time, they're going to really lose their marbles. You know, it's like, it's that mm. thing. And, and he was kind of like, so ready to kind of share that with the universe. Uh, yeah. It's not an easy one, but it is also like, it's good. It's a nice secret to have, you know? Yeah. Hugh Hammer is a great character. Can't wait. Yeah. Can't and wait. Tom Bennett as, as Ulf, you are going to love oh, him. Yeah. Oh yeah, there are a lot of exciting characters coming into play in season two and yeah. potentially season three. So um, yeah, can't absolutely cannot wait. Martin Alejandro asks, "What's your favorite part about playing a knight of the Queen's Guard?" Um, I suppose character-wise, the most interesting thing is that you're in the inner circle. I mean, you're not a primary character. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm under no illusions that Samar Brand is not the lead of this show. Um, but what I do love is that his proximity to power, his, um, I suppose he probably knows more than nearly anybody else in Westeros about what's going on in the inner sanctum. I mean, if you, if you are always at the door, you are always by the side of the person making the decision where these things are happening. Um, that for me is really interesting. And I had lots of conversations about that with um, with directors and stuff. It's like at this point, I probably know things that other people in the room don't know, purely because I've by dint of being proximity to Rhaenyra, you know, hearing the conversation, being in a space where I, I probably am privy to more information than many other people in the court. Um, and I think that character-wise, that's a really interesting place that the Queen's Guard live because it's so familial. It's it is like. Yeah, it's like a family. They're all there. And they're in the very core at the same time as being slightly outside of. So it's an interesting, um, yeah, it's an interesting uh, conflict, I suppose. It's a great dynamic. Um, um, yeah, and really interesting for me as to play, to have, again, it's, the camera's not on me. We're not focusing on what I'm doing. But in my head, I can always think as somebody else walks in, like, what do I know at this point that they don't know? What is the difference between our experiences? And, yeah, and always put that into sort of like playing subtext within myself. The next one is from Chaircat. Do you feel the pressure of being in a show like House of the Dragon? 
Um, uh, so far, luckily, touch wood, I've had no pressure apart from um, my your own pressure to kind of do as good a job as possible. Um, as I said, it's a very, very happy, very inclusive set. Uh, and I'm really lucky to work with people like Emma, who is extraordinary and always you know, turns up to work so prepared and so ready to, you know, kick ass that, um, I, you know, the, the pressure is not on my shoulders. The pressure is, is on, on the, you know, the big leads and on, and on Ryan and the people who are kind of, I suppose, carrying it. Uh, so for me, it's just been a joy to be a part of. And uh, more pressure like this, please. I'll take uh, hmm. plenty more. Please. Yeah. Then the last fan question for today comes from Jesus V. What were you actually looking at when Damon was threatening you with Karaxis? Um, Very little. Very little. There was actually, we didn't have a tennis ball then. I think we've just given an eye line. But there was this, on top of Monsanto, there's a big, um, I think it's television mast or some huge sort of audio mast, whatever it was. And I think, you know, me and uh, me and Sir Stefan were kind of, we picked a spot about halfway up. Mm. And it was incredible. If you rewatch the scene, like the sun was literally right in our eyes. So the higher you look, the more it's kind of like right in your eyes and trying so hard not to have like tears running down my face. It's like, I don't want to look like I'm so terrified of cracks that I'm weeping. But literally it was like looking directly into the sun. It was a great performance. Uh, that was yeah. very well acted. I, cool moment. Like, um, it is challenging, I imagine, to, to look at like a tennis ball and imagine a dragon roaring at you. It's like, that's... Yeah, Good work. That's that's why you need Lonnie to do the roaring for you. Oh yeah, the director. <laughs> <laughs> um, I only have one more for you. If you had to describe season two non-spoilery in one sentence, how would you how would you do that? Bigger, darker, more dragons. More dragons. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today, Max. Thank you for having me. Wish you nothing but the best and can't wait to see you in season two. Super, yeah. Tune in. It's gonna be um it's gonna be a wild ride. Oh definitely. And we are yeah, we can't wait. We are ready. It's been way too awesome. long. Nice to meet you. Oh, you too. Thank you guys for watching. Head over to Max's Instagram, show him some love, and uh yeah. take care and see us later. <laughs>